So Lex, thanks for thanks for starting in on your <laughs> intro already. <laughs> Well, we're going to have a lot of fun here today, guys. So I am Ryan Sean Adams um, from uh, Bankless, and uh, the Monolith crew asked me to moderate this exciting panel. So I have three very interesting guests for you. I'm going to let them introduce themselves in just a moment. But today's panel is going to talk about, we're going to talk about the synergies between economics, politics, and blockchain. So those three areas with a specific focus on crypto and blockchain, of course, and uh, the DeFi landscape as well. So I am joined by Lex from Consensus, uh, Misha from Monolith, and Yalda from Artark. Uh, from Artark. So um, guys, I would just love if you would spend a minute uh, to introduce yourselves and the projects that you're working on. And why don't we start with you, Lex? Sure. Um, thanks so much for having me and to the whole crew for uh, organizing this uh, conversation. I'm very excited for uh, the terrain on which we're going to travel. Uh, my background is, um, I guess, a, a sampling of all the, the, the parts of the financial services meal. Uh, I started my career out at Lehman Brothers and so, uh, you know, had an uh, early lesson in large company failure. Uh, early on in my career. I then went on to build a uh, robo-advisor in the uh, early 2010s uh, and went through kind of a fintech journey. And so I'd say my foundational experience is really uh, fintech and that intermediate step to where we are now. Um, and during, during that work, uh, I fell in love with uh, the Ethereum space and particularly the idea of building financial software on Ethereum and joined Consensus um, uh, a little bit over a year ago to help run a project called Consensus Codify. And so uh, Codify is a blockchain operating system for financial services, and it spans from the more conservative incumbent focused projects that do uh, enterprise blockchain and digital asset tokenization all the way through trying to connect and bridge uh, assets into decentralized finance where we do a lot of things around data, risk management, uh, and trying to make things interoperable. Fantastic. Thanks, Lex. Yelda, how about you? Hi, hey, thanks for having me on this uh, panel. Um, uh, yeah, so my name's Yalda and I'm the CEO of Autark. Uh, my background is I've been in, I guess I've been doing product management for about 12 years. And uh, most recently, um, you know, for Autark within the, the DAO ecosystem. Um, and we're focusing on building tools to enable like small scale or large scale collaboration. Um, our team in initially came together um, because we're interested in building like a social collaboration platform for people to crowdsource and crowdfund, um, you know, large initiatives, whether it's like space exploration or uh, even like climate change, uh, you know, climate science and mitigating existential risks. So, uh, so that was like the original vision that we came came in around, and now we're we're just trying to um, like reimagine. Um, how, how you can build a collaborative tool set that can, you know, work for regular organizations or these larger scale projects as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Yalda. And Misha, how about yourself? Um, hi, I'm Misha. Um, I'm CTO here at Monolith. Um, I'm an ex-web guy. I spent lots of time doing W3C work, building standards for data on the web. Um, and I've been working in startups for the last 10 years, I guess. I've built an identity theft protection product. I've tried to build a healthcare company. I've tried to build a, a news platform, which always showed you both sides of the argument. And now I'm trying to build a credible banking alternative. Um, yeah, I guess I'm interested in data privacy I'm the reason why there's no tracking on the NHS or on the BBC. I've been campaigning for stuff like that. Um, but yeah, very excited to be here. And, you know, thanks. Fantastic. 
Thank you, Misha. I hope to get into some of those privacy issues as we as we discuss the topics today. Um, so y you've heard the panel. We've got Lex, who's who's kind of a, a you know building a bridge from fintech to blockchain and DeFi. We've got Yalda, who is all about DAOs and social coordination. We've got Misha, who has an open source background. He is actually trying to build a startup on the DeFi infrastructure. So we've got three very interesting um, opinions here. And I want to really set the, the context for this discussion, because I think one of the themes coursing through this discussion is about skin in the game. So Nassim uh, Taleb in, in uh, some of his books has talked about the importance of, of skin in the game um, basically, if you don't have skin in the game, uh, maybe y your opinion is is kind of worth less. Like skin in the game is the ultimate form of, uh, you know, truth in in terms of whether you're invested in a particular opinion or position. But let's talk about skin in the game for a minute. Uh, what does skin in the game actually mean for you, and what are the best ways uh, you've seen it harnessed? And I'm going to open this to crypto and non-crypto at first. We could, we could talk about either sides of it. And I wanna start with you, Lex, because you're the bridge here. So what is skin in the game and what are some of the ways you've seen it honest in the real world and in the crypto world? Ooh, um, I literally goosebumps. Um, so, <laughs> uh, you know, so I'll give the boring answer so that others can, can give the interesting uh, token economics answer. Um, there, so the first thing is that bringing money to a system isn't necessarily the the best way to give people skin in the game, right? Um, you're in many ways are the landed gentry if that's your system, right? If uh, if how much you stake is uh, how much your vote is worth, but in in various economic and political systems, there have been various ways to create representation, right? And so. Um, whether it is representative democracy uh, or whether it is uh, direct democracy, you know, one person, one vote, or one state, one vote, uh, there's there's lots of ways for people to translate their point of view into um, into an outcome. I think if you if I think about just my experience, like um, I was able to start a company and have equity in it for. You know, 500 bucks and a filing with Delaware. And I didn't need to uh, come from a background where I had lots of assets to put into a protocol or stake something um, in order for, for me to feel super invested in an idea and bringing it to fruition. And I think uh, there are a number of established mechanisms, whether it's, uh, whether it's equity or whether it is um, uh, having a board seat on a, on a company that um, that let you have that that let you have that alignment I think what what was enormously uh, what was really a discovery of the last two three years and the parts that resonate with me with tokenomics is that we are now able to combine that feeling of ownership and equity and if I do work I'll get an economic account outcome and I can really like raise myself by the bootstraps we can combine that feeling of my work is my is going to be my victory if i do a good job um, with the open source movement and um i don't want to steal any thunder but you know one of the things that that humans do as as animals is that um, we don't just live our lives for money uh, or for success we also have uh, love and affection and craft and Generally speaking, people are happy not from not from economics, but from like building a thing well over time. And I think a lot of the uh, the progress on in the open source movement is is from um, that craft, from wanting to contribute, from building community, from being engaged, from being seen as an ex, ex, uh, expert. Uh, one fun fact is that the uh, SpaceX rocket that just connected to the International Space Station runs on Linux. You know that's that's the software that they're using, um, and so I think what we can do in our in our blockchain community is combine that feeling of equity and being able to win for yourself if you do a fantastic job with the ethos of like I want to do something bigger than just myself. 
Great take, Lex. And, and Misha, I want to pull you into this, uh, into this conversation a little bit because I know you have a passion for open source. I think Lex is making the point you know, in a couple of ways. Number one, that capital isn't necessarily the only form of skin in the game. There are other forms of skin in the game, um, maybe reputation, other things that could also be important. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about that, riff on that, and uh, tell us how open source fits in here and its intersection with crypto? Um, yeah, I think if we look at open source at the moment, this sense of community or the sense of wanting to give something back or build something which other people can build on top of, um, most of the way that people survive on top of open source is through charitable donations, right? So big organizations, use open source software and then decide to give some sort of donation to a bunch of people to look after it. And I guess the stuff which got me really interested in all this token economics stuff was hearing people speak about how the natural progression of open source could be alignment around token economics. It could be that as we build abstraction layers on top of things like Ethereum um, and that and if people are building those basically software or protocol, um, they can be incentivized or the builders can get micro fractions of payments for people using their pieces or a community can, um, as opposed to relying on charitable donations to be actually encode that incentivization model from the outset. And I think that's pretty interesting. Um, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen that working just yet. I think it's all just ideas and people talking about it, but it seems to be a movement there. It seems to be that this is where engineers are pushing. Um, there seems to be traction in this space. I think and before before please. we bring Yelda into this conversation, w one question for you, Misha. So um, how about the project, and this is a consensus project, uh, but, but Gitcoin, we've maybe seen some progress in that space. What's, what's your take there? Um, I think Gitcoin is interesting. I think, um, the NIM project is interesting where people are um, being incentivized in order to protect the internet and there's some economic models there. I think Ethereum itself and mining and staking, there's in incentivization models. So it's not like we aren't making progress there. Um, I just don't see that specific example of people building software and running it on top of the infrastructure and building kind of onion layers on top of infrastructure and the community of people which maintain that being supported by it. Um, just a, a couple of things on skin in the game for me. I think um, skin in the game isn't a, a crypto only thing. I think the people consider voting to be that like ultimate form of skin in the game. And I think what actually something with someone on the team, our, our CEO says a lot and really put a smile on my face. So I'm just going to regurgitate. Our, our real vote isn't that once in every four years where we go and kind of put something in a ballot box. Our real vote is the capital which we give to people who choose how to distribute that on planet Earth and choose what to invest in and what not to invest in. And I think anything which moves or any technology or any movement which tries to break these central decision making, unelected central decision making down is exciting. The future. Fantastic point. So, so money and uh, capital being kind of a, um, a system. And when you vo vote with capital, um, that's sort of a, a you know, a governance uh, mechanism, a, a way of um, stating your opinion. So Yalda, I want to bring you into the, into the conversation too. So it seems to me that DAOs can play a really exciting and important role in this. And maybe for, for folks that aren't listening, or that aren't familiar with what a DAO actually is, maybe you could kind of um, talk about that for a minute and then talk about how it can help communities with this skin in the game problem. Yeah, so a DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization, um, I like to describe it as an organization that operates based on rules encoded on the blockchain. Um, that's more of like a smart contract based DAO, but a lot of people say like Bitcoin is a DAO, Ethereum is a DAO, um, because uh, if, you, if you get it down to like the base layer, well, what's, what's the main decision people are making to 
may like have like the Bitcoin DAO. It's like you install software, so it's like the vote that you're doing each time you upgrade or each time um, some decision happens as you upgrade the software and you're trusting that that upgrade is gonna continue to maintain the network because you're a miner. And if you, you know, upgrade something that fucks things up, you can lose money. Um, <laughs> that's to, to put it very TLDR. Um, so so that's that's how like a, a blockchain DAO would work is like you, you have to make good decisions and the forks that you're um, choosing to upgrade um, because that can impact your 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 investment um, or like with staking with proof of stake how much you're um, willing to put um, put up there. But yeah, I guess um, the the other mechanism that has been really taking off in the Ethereum space has been in Moloch DAO, um, the rage quit um, where you know your vote is weighted by how much money you put in. Um, and if you don't agree with like a vote that's about to pass, you can take your money out um, during a grace period. Um, and I think that that's, that's seen a lot of, uh, I guess that's probably the most popular DAO mechanism in the Ethereum space right now. Um, um, but yeah, I guess those are, those are definitely in the blockchain space. It's, it's more financial examples of skin in the game like that. But, but even, um, you know, like, uh, like I'm a member of Moloch DAO and I don't have as many um, like shares as a lot of other people. And sometimes I think, oh, does it even matter if I vote? Like, it's like, uh, it's not gonna make that, it's not gonna make that big of a difference because everyone else has so much more money. Um, but I think that there, there is still like this whole, like, um, like the whole like, oh, well, if I talk to people and like the discord chat and I like voice my opinion and uh, people start to either like, you know, trust your opinions down the line or not. I guess you can, you can gain, yeah, re reputation that way just for becoming an active member. And then maybe people will vote based on what you're saying. And then you just have to hope that, you know, six months from now, whenever you say, yeah, people will vote for that. Like you're not gonna like make a really bad decision or recommendation for the network because yeah, you're putting, you're putting your own like reputation at risk whenever you're coming in and like championing a proposal. Um, so, so there is that within DAOs. So even if you don't have that much money, um, you could still have that reputation with, with the decisions you're making just to actually submit the proposals. Like if you keep submitting proposals and they keep getting rejected, then will be like, well, what, what's why, why, why is this person like wasting my time with these shitty proposals? So, um, so that's, that's another way to think about in DAOs. And then in uh, one example I liked in general, like outside of the monetary space is like, um, like you build a product, um, let's say you'll be, you're building a new multi-sig wallet and then you're asking other people to put their money in that multi-sig wallet, but you're not even using that multi-sig yet. You're using some other thing that someone else built. So it's like, why, why should someone trust me, like this product developer, if I'm not even trusting my own software with, with my own assets? So I think that's, that's the other aspect of it where, um, you know, in the, in the book, it's also like, a, like you're a doctor and you're, you know, you're whatever, or you're, like you're, you're deciding to like bomb another city and you're not there, you know? So right. it's like, those are, those are the other decisions where it's like, um, where it's a decision that can impact other people's lives or other people's like assets, and, and it's a decision that someone make um, someone makes to decide to use that service um, potentially. So I think that that's that's one of the major ones in in the blockchain ecosystem that that exists today. I very, very much like those points, y'all. So so one is that it's not just about financial skin in the game; it's also about reputation. Uh, and, and the second is that skin in the game can take many forms. So um, I like, for example, that the Gnosis team put some of their funds in their own multi-sig wallet. That makes me feel a lot better about the, the, the Gnosis product uh, because you know they have skin in the game with their wallet. If it fails, uh, they certainly lose out as well. Um, but, but, but blockchain and crypto so far is, uh, is almost like a, a, a property rights system, almost like a, a, a property management system uh, and it's concerned primarily with with capital, with money, and I think that's probably why it's gravitated to these early um, DeFi type use cases. I, I guess that that brings up a, a question around accessibility. 
Um, we call some of these protocols DeFi, decentralized finance. But if you look at a um, very successful DAO, like the Maker DAO, for instance, um, votes are essentially controlled by a fairly small like majority of, of large whales who own the majority of MKR tokens. Um, Lex, you know, you, you talked about in your, your original comment that there, there are other forms of governance. Um, this is governance by capital, so one token, one vote. Are we ever able to get anything beyond that on, on crypto and in crypto systems? And is that going to be a limiting factor for us? Um, I will take your question and I will add a question to it. I'm just curious for everyone here. I don't, I don't know if you know, but um, have you taken the Myers-Briggs personality tests? Uh, nod for yes. Okay, at least, okay, everybody has. Okay, um, can I just ask everybody to say their, their uh, profile? I'll start, I'm, a, I'm an INTJ. I'm an INTP. Okay. I'm an ENFP, but depending on when you do it, you get different answers. Ooh. I did it when I first met my wife, and I got a very different answer to when I was less happy in my life. Yeah. I'm trying to remember what it was when I last took it. Fair the enough. Ar the, ar the architect or something like that. Yeah, so I think that's that's probably also like a NTJ. Uh, variant. So I guess I was trying to make a rhetorical point, um, which is um, we often have a philosophy or a discussion of accessibility, democratization, making, you know, creating access for everybody, having things be permissionless. Um, but in front of our utopia is a, is a, 12 hour math exam. So anyone can use it as long as you're this personality type and you have this background and you like these things, right? Um, and so on the one hand, there there's the obvious point, which is, you know, the, the assets you control um, are probably source number one from uh, early participation in the system. So what kind of person participates early in a crypto economic system? Um, how many children do they have that they have to take care of full time that they can spend the, the, the free time on Reddit uh, or cooler places? Uh, and then number two is, you know, how much how much do they bring to the table already with with existing assets? And where does that come from? So those all have distributional impact. And I think you you, you might try to solve that by talking about um, some version of identity. And I know this is a, this is a can of worms we're gonna open later, but uh, how you represent identity, whether it's tied to a nation state, whether it's tied to a household or an individual, can you have multiple identities? Can you earn identities? Uh, you know, how many, sh how many ships do you have in EVE Online? Like there, there's lots of ways to get there. Um, but but the the second answer is also um, if we want this to be an inclusive system, I think um, look end of the day I do think you have to file away the the edges. So caveat emptor and Coda's law like and the Ayn Rand philosophy they're all fantastic fantastic starting points. Um, I'll give you an example. So I went to law school, which also indicts me. Um, but I went to law school, and one of the most interesting. Um, anecdotes and times of American law was uh, around um, what employers could do to their employees. And in particular, towards, towards the end of the 1800s um, in the United States, people were laying uh, the railroads. So putting, putting tracks all throughout the land. And there were multiple private companies. They were not public uh, projects. There were, there were private companies that were crisscrossing the, the states. And as you know, the fortunes that are built out of these railroads were m multiple times whatever Jeff Bezos was worth in, in those dollars. And so they had a lot of pricing power to get people to do whatever they needed uh, on, on constructing this stuff. And the law captured the following fact. Um, there was no regulation of trains or, and there was no regulation of train tracks. And so you could have different types of train tracks depending on what kind of uh, train company you were, you were uh, 
built by and then um, in order for trains to transfer from one track to another or to connect like new new uh, containers, literally there'd be some uh, enterprising 14 year old that would be sitting at the end of the train with like a metal pin and their job was to smash into the other train and put the pin in so it's connected. Um, and out of this job came thousands and thousands of uh, uh, court cases of broken limbs and mangled people and like just all that, just like f just flesh, flesh everywhere, right? Um, and so to me, that's a really bright example of like um, the Austrian school left completely open, you know, and filing away the edges and making sure that you do have some protections and you do think about people who have a different background and maybe are not, you know, as powerful as you are uh, in this particular ecosystem. Very interesting line of thought. Let's just keep flowing with this, Misha. I think something which really springs to mind when we talk about all these things, so I don't want to jump ahead, but we're talking about capital having capital before starting participation in this new economy. And I guess the big issue is, or the reason why we are here and where we're at is because most of the players participating in this conversation are, you know, for-profit money-making entities. And, you know, we are a money-making entity and um, this is a capitalist game and what most people or lots of people in this space in the in the finance they're trying to disrupt a, um, a really well-established kind of beast of an industry which has lots of power and until we start getting governments which uh, depending on what where you where your head is at politically i don't really want to get into this too much but um they have a they have a role in um looking after peoples and making sure that there's education and there's you know clean air and there's a future for everyone and until players like that start participating and thinking about token economics um yeah i worry i worry about it just being in another more efficient money-making opportunity. And just to riff on this a bit, and um, this is how I sleep at night. Um, I think at, as time would go on, if de decentralized finance would work, and if we could build something which is a credible alternative to a bank account, I think sure, um, we become a central entity which has some power, albeit not, I don't think as much as the people which we're trying to usurp her. Um, I think that is to me enough and interesting to bring new ideas and to bring new modes of operation, which hopefully people can innovate on top of. But I think while we're stuck in this capitalists playing the capitalist game on a system which is just more efficient or has the potential to be more efficient, um, I worry where the where I worry about where we're going to get a different point of view if they're not at the table whilst we're creating all of these systems. That makes sense. Am I making sense? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, and I, th I think that's an interesting theme. Like Yalta, I want to bring you into this. Um, so, how do we make sure that the DeFi system we're creating doesn't become, you know, the the robber baron system? of the early 1900s that Lex was describing? <laughs> How do we do that? Um, yeah, I guess there's always going to be an element of, you know, more chaos, whether um, just because of the early days where there will be bugs in code and also um, these govern governance mechanisms that no one has really fully tried before. Like, how do you manage this in a decentralized manner like what does it even mean is is it decentralized if all the voting stake is like under one entity i think that like in the ethereum space we even like agree with what decentralization means um <laughs> because it's like okay well if any like it's still decentralized if it's like plutocracy i think that's just kind of like what people accept it's like uh as long as there isn't like some like uh kind of kill switch or like admin switch that like the company has that's creating the pr protocol. 
um, I think people call that centralized, but if there's no like backdoor like that, even if like uh, all the token holders, or even if one entity holds all the tokens, that's still considered like decentralized. Um, but I guess that's that's the thing. It's like, what is what does this word word decentralized even mean anymore? And is that is 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 if that is something that we find important, um, then we should come up with like something that's more like, oh, democratic or something like that, not just like it's decentralized on the blockchain. So I think um, we we probably just need a better understanding for what we actually want in this space. I think a lot of this just kind of like, it's like, oh, let's build this, let's build that. And you're, you're building all these things and you kind of start to lose meaning with why you were building it in the first place. It's like governance becomes an afterthought versus like thinking about it from, from the beginning for it's like, okay, if you want to like avoid this like one entity controlling everything, then you have to think about that more in the beginning with how you distribute tokens um, and what have you. Because if you are well intentioned with it, you can um, do as much as you can to avoid uh, you know a couple entities controlling everything. But I don't. I think that that's kind of like a lie. I think a lot of people don't really care about that. Um, and. And it might it might be because like uh, no one has fully really cracked decentralized governance if it's not like a fully token weighted system because of um, identity or because of like reputation systems or whatever you want to call it reputation systems not really fully like, existing um, yeah so I think that it might it might take like about more like five years or so um, until people really start to move away from this more like plutocratic systems so I, i'm not seeing it like this year but i feel like probably like in five years and it might be more like federated networks that just seems like uh, I, I can't see any anything else yeah so y'all i think right on and, and uh, i want to dive into that with the panel a, a, a bit more in in some detail because i think we've discussed it a few times so it feels very much like we have the tools in crypto and blockchain um, to manage capital and governed by plutocracy, by basically uh, some form of shareholder ownership. Um, but the question is, do we even, even if our aspirations are good, and I ask this to the panel, uh, that we want a more decentralized, more human controlled um, kind of protocol, are we even able to get there with the tools at our disposal, with the primitives? Um, Lex, you mentioned that we are missing um, identity. Can you talk a little bit about that and then maybe open this to the panel? Are, are, like, is that something that's just completely missing from crypto? And unless we have, we won't have anything other than plutocratic style governance? Um, what a fantastically difficult question. I'm going to uh, dodge it first with another anecdote. Um, and I'll, I'll get to identity um, because uh, absolutely it's the next leg of the stool. Um, but the the anecdote is, is kind of it was kind of weird so um i don't know if you know jocko who is a famous podcaster uh gigantic former marine who's sort of like very take take control of your dense destiny like everything he does is in black and white and his neck is uh, wider than if you take all of us combined um so one of his leadership uh lessons was about um delegation and just how empowered the teams are on the ground. So we think of the military as this like tyrannically hierarchical organization, right? It's just it's just a org structure and that's it. Um, but the reason that it works, especially in the fog of war and on the ground where basically the only information is local to a team of whatever it is, five, 10 people, um, is because that that team on the ground of five to 10 people has full autonomy and full decision-making power and full control. Um, and he kept using the word, uh, like he kept using the word decentralized command, which to me was just so super weird knowing how we talk about DeFi and decentralization. Um, and I do think that when, that you can either have like command control with full autonomy at the bottom, um, because it's super clear how things go, or you can have raging bands of warlords, uh, which I think we've seen very clearly in the Bitcoin space. Um, you know, and so I would posit to the group, 
that there there's a there's a mix of centralization and hierarchy that that might be surprising that we might not yet know what that outcome looks like um to engage on on the second point and i'm not suggesting crypto military like please uh, please not just uh, just i found that surprising um the to engage in identity. So consensus was early in uh, building out and working on identity. And so we have a, a project uh, called Uport, uh, which has recently merged with uh, the, the civil project and really uh, try to push forward the idea of self-sovereign X. And there's, there's different versions of identity, right? There's identity for an individual, there's uh, identity for an organization. So if we want the sci-fi world with lots, lots of corporations making corporate copies on, on a blockchain with, with AI, you know, you, you need to have uh, identity at the corporate level as well. Um, and I, th I think there's been, um, there's been a struggle to to really merge these worlds together because it's not as easy as this, you know, you upload your passport and then you tokenize the hash, you, you like, you put a hash on the chain and like, that's it, that's your identity. Um, because the identity we're talking about that functions within nation states today is really a, um, it's, it's like a, it's a, it's a positive, uh, it's a positive grant. Right, um, we are past the Renaissance, uh, where divine uh, divine natural rights were seen as in, endowed on us, um, and rather, your identity is intricately today tied to the state in which you operate, so that the state can mediate your rights relative to other participants in that state. You know, so your U.S. passport gives you benefits from social security to Medicare to whatever. And then it also takes things away, whether it's through tax or through property rights of others or whatever. If you take your passport and you go to uh, randomly gonna say, you know, China and you wave around your American passport, it is, it is not identity in the same way as, is, as it is on American soil. And so um, until we have something to anchor, a blockchain identity onto such that there is a set of mechanisms to enforce property rights to that identity. I think we are, we're really just, you know, uh, writing a blog post about philosophy rather than actually implementing something. Very interesting. So, so I want to ask uh, other members of the panel, given what Lex was talking about, um, you know, what's your take? So what does that mean? Does that mean, we're not going to get there. Crypto is not able to get there. Um, it, is it a tech, technical limitation? Is it more of a social limitation? Uh, just signal if you've, if you've got something to say on that. Um, so I guess I would say one one other one other important aspect is actually going to be you know privacy of your identity and your information and um, and. This is this is this is where it's like okay, well, how how much of this system is blockchain? How much of it? Can someone else say something as well? We're yeah, we're still connected. Me. I think it's just um, it's just Yalda. Did we lose Yalda? I think we may have lost Yelda. The CIA got her. <laughs> she may be rejoining. Does anyone want to continue that thought? Oh, there she is. Oops. <laughs> hey, Yelda. Sorry about that. No worries. Can you still hear us? Yeah. Am I okay now? Yes, you're good. Go ahead okay. and continue your thought. Um, yeah, so I was saying um, th there is this whole, like, yeah, state-based identity system or, like, global system where it's based on your, like, biometrics, that sort of thing. Um, and, and I think for that to really work in the blockchain space, we everyone needs to be more secure that it's not going to be, you know, used against them for dystopian mechanisms or 
like chain analysis, having even more data on everyone than they do now. And I think that's kind of like, it's never, it's never gonna work un unless, unless we know that your blockchain identity is not gonna like be another data point for these blockchain forensic systems. So I, I personally would not want to use anything and, unless I know it is actually gonna like make my life easier, like protect my privacy in better, in better ways. Um, so I have not seen any like indication of us being close to anything like that yet. Um, but I think what what can be more interesting as far as like wh why why is identity important um, has to do with like uniqueness um, and there being other ways to prove your uniqueness based on social graphs. Um, so there's this project called Bright ID um, where they're they're attempting to solve this just based on like connections and if you're connected to a lot of other people that are real versus like botnets and coming up with like a score like a like your uniqueness score. And I think that's what's gonna, that's what will really work well in this blockchain space. Um, because like, that's, like I said, that's ultimately like you, you want to protect against like civil attacks. So, so for that, you need to like prove that someone's like a person and not a bot. And I think that's what's gonna, that, that's what can work well in the next couple of years. Um, but having like your actual, like, you know, like something where you can like go to another planet, like your your interplanetary identity system. I think we're gonna have that at some point. If you just think about like the projection of like humanity, like a hundred years from now, it's like our paper passport tying to like one country on earth. That's not really gonna be like how we get around the solar system. So uh, so if, if you just like think like a hundred years, like what's, what's identity, what, what are your, like credentials between moving through like planets and zones, like what's that gonna look like? It's like, it's not gonna be a piece of paper, um, but I think we're still like a ways off from that being a, a technology that anyone's gonna really trust. So Misha, what, what your perspective on this as a CTO? So um, y'all was talking about the, you know, the, the civil problem, right? Civil resistance and that sort of thing. I don't know if you could describe that. I mean, is it is it a solvable problem? Could we actually solve that problem without um, a nation state involved assigning identities to people? I think the, I think that reputation based social graph is very interesting. And I think it touches on the previous uh, some themes which we had during this conversation. So if if inclusion means that Experian needs to know whether or not you're good at credit, we've already lobbed out a big proportion of the of planet Earth from inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, if we if we want to if we want to build a product whereby you need not understand private keys and signing things and all of that kind of craziness. Um, we need to move away from kind of your private key as ownership. And I think these tensions around um, what is truly decentralized and what is kind of code is law versus um, how that realizes in the real world when someone goes, hey, actually, that person stole my piece of paper, which has my private key on it. And I think when once we see that panning out, and I know, I actually know that that has panned out in the UK and in, in our in our legal framework. Um, someone's managed to prove that someone stole their crypto and sent it to a centralized exchange, and the centralized exchange had to pay out. Um, had to give that back. I think all of these things become really interesting. Um, and I don't have a good solution for these things, but my guess is that ownership based on some mnemonic phrase is just not gonna take us into the mainstream and it's not gonna drive adoption. And some way of articulating identity and connecting real people um, has has to happen for this to kind of pick up, and that's you know, my opinion on the on these things. I think the things which are difficult about identity is people have different identities. People like to dress up and call themselves something else on the weekend. People like to, you know, people live come from places, different parts of the world where they have to have different identities. Um, I can't claim I'm atheist in certain parts of the world, right? Uh, I can get hung for that. Um, but it's a part of my, it's on my Twitter handle. Um, 
Yeah, I think it's a very complicated thing. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a good answer for this. And I think the social proof experiment is interesting. It's also why, and I hate to use this word, it's also why I think Libra is very interesting because they have the biggest social graph. They have the most data on whether or not someone is probably real and is probably a human being. Um, and they would have had the best chance of actually giving modern um, payment infrastructure to lots of people in the world where by, I don't know, visas might not touch. Yeah, I think yeah, there's, there's something there. So, so Misha just opened it up. He just said, I think Libra is interesting. <laughs> Why don't we get into that? I think. Because of the social graph. You have a big, where you all the, yeah. So, so, okay. So. Let me, let me throw something out here for you guys to digest then, and we can talk about you know uh, why Libra is interesting or you know what ways it's interesting. Some would say that the purpose of crypto is to uh, remove the nation state. So if the nation state kind of does two things, you know, one is um, property law, essentially you know, settlement, um, and, and the second is it assigns identity. Um, the purpose of crypto is to remove the reliance on the nation state for those two things and uh, create uh, essentially a, a world where we can all become you know internet native citizens and we can use internet native money and we can use internet native identity and we have an internet native property management system um, some would say libra is the antithesis of that uh, that it is very uh, much centralized and becomes just a tool or a vassal uh, for the state um, Others, you know, might make a, a different claim and say that these things like social graph are uh, essential and important and will lead to a more open, permissionless financial world. Um, I, I'm interested in both sides of that argument. Um, Lex, do you want to take a side in that argument and, and talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, I think there are a number of um, points within that that require like a lot of precision and a lot of language to to really open up um i i would be a big fan of this concept of uh of a web3 native uh, uh nation i guess uh because it's not geographically bounded it's a collection of people right like a nation state you can have um you can have a nation that is stateless um uh, I don't don't want to make this immediately dark, but like the the t the last time we we had a nation without a state, uh, well, one of the times we had a nation without a state um, was during World War II, and then no state was protecting the nation, uh, which was fleeing from Germany and had no home, right? And that led to a whole bunch of knock-on effects that were. Uh, we we I don't want to engage with that with that substance, but like generally, a nation without a state has has been historically a tragedy, uh, and and people want to find their ground and take control of it and settle and build walls and um, and then there's the adjacent issue of like end of the day we're still all monkeys in a banana tree and we can imagine ourselves to be better, but um, there's the Dunbar number and then there's your DNA uh, and you know all your behavioral biases and. There's, there's not much you can do. Um, and then kind of a, uh, an addendum to that is, here, I've solved identity. We take your DNA, we put it on blockchain, and blockchain says uh, you fully control privacy. Like, it's all up to you. It's just your DNA on the blockchain. No one can ever access it. And I guarantee you will have to have an opt-in rate less than 1%. Um, you know, so so we're, we're human, and that 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 is the issue not the software not the tech not the technology necessarily so going back to libra i think facebook um along with uh shopify and a few other uh libra consortium members uh, or more broadly you can say silicon valley so silicon valley has created an internet a web two nation uh which has two to three billion in it. So that nation is bigger than uh, the US, and it's bigger than China, and it's bigger than Russia, and you could make some arguments about how that nation elects presidents and starts wars and so on. Um, and so I think we're already seeing what the boundaries of that look like. And we also are seeing what the boundaries of a Web3 nation look like. Um, 
and again, the sort of like nomadic warlord type uh, environment. I think the the Libra Consortium is very dangerous uh, as it relates to the Web3 nation, um, not because of its core philosophy, but because of its economic and regulatory promise. So if you're a developer or you're, or you're a builder, you're a creative person, or if you're just somebody that wants to make money and set up a business, would you rather go fight as a rebel in the trenches with tools you've never touched before, uh, or just API into Facebook's 2 billion people? And so what I'm worried about is the economic and psychic pull of that easier ecosystem while still co-opting words blockchain and crypto assets and things like that. Um, and I think it can be this fool's gold that really undermines the network effects that we've started to develop um, in Ethereum. You know, I think the endpoint for Libra is to be a payment rail, um, is just a, a Visa or MasterCard network with lower fees with uh, CBDCs traveling on it. Uh, so stable coins, all the nodes are going to be uh, under a particular regulatory regime. Uh, and so there's, I don't find it like threatening as a f existential thing, but much more as the opportunity cost of somebody going and building on Ethereum. So Lex, I want to ask you this. So you, you said you're worried about Libra, right? Not as an existential thing to you, Ethereum necessarily, but what's wrong with that world? Uh, a Libra world where instead of Ethereum or instead of you know, Bitcoin, uh, we're all just using the Facebook Libra system and we're using central bank digital currencies. What's wrong with that world? Why are you worried about it? So I'm not worried about a world of central bank digital currencies uh, at all. I think um, something like 80% of Ethereum's economic value is now denominated in uh, stable coins, which means that uh, people have, shown, uh, have chosen their currency for uh, crypto and they've chosen the dollar just is. I mean, it's not a philosophical statement. Um, so throwing CBDCs into that mix, I think, is fantastic. Public money is bigger than private money, so let's let's have it flow in. Um, the, the thing that I uh, think will happen in the Facebook world, uh, I mean, I don't want to throw a stone into, in, into the window, but I think it's the same thing as like, why would I not be excited about, uh, so Visa has an open innovation program. MasterCard has an open innovation program. JP Morgan has a FinTech fund. Um, none of them have created DeFi and none of them have created systemic change and really uh, are incentivized to boil away all of the uh, competitive barriers between the asset classes, payments, banking, lending, insurance, investments, and so on. Um, you, you still have this enormous mosaic of extremely inefficient financial infrastructure, which is you know anywhere between, call it 250 billion to a couple of trillion in enterprise value. And so I think Ethereum as a financial infrastructure and an economic infrastructure can entirely replace all of that, um, and it's incentivized to do that, and because people have the skin in the game that we talked about, they actually own the token. They can benefit from from this without having private equity or anything like that. Um, and I just think innovation lives in this open environment in a way that it just can't possibly in in a Libra or a Facebook environment. Um, and again, I go back to. SpaceX's Dragon running the Linux operating system. I think that's that's the world I want to be on. So it's an interesting point here. Um, I've I've heard people compare Libra to AOL, maybe like Close Garden, uh, whereas something like Ethereum is closer to like the internet. It's permissionless. Uh, Misha, you know what's your take on that? Is um, is Ethereum much more open to open source innovation than something like? Libra? Yeah, I think, just to be clear, I would much rather see Ethereum kind of succeed over Libra. Yeah, I think um, <laughs> I think it's open source in this, it's community. I think the fact that it's not controlled by a, uh, a powerhouse of a central entity. Um, 
I guess the thing which I think about to myself, like obviously Ethereum is just way better and the world would be a better place on top of built on top of it. And I do believe that given the way the web has gone with centralization of power basically into San Francisco uh, or West Coast or America, wherever they are, with Amazons and Googles and everyone owning most of the web's infrastructure. I think decentralized ideas into an into, into interplanetary file system is probably the only thing which could ever compete in that space. So we have to keep pushing and building here. Um, the thing which this is probably quite controversial and I'm not a Facebook fanboy in any shape or form, but if Ethereum didn't work out, I would have liked to have seen change in banking. And if Facebook would have come and created a new monopoly there, um, I quite like the idea of power changing hands, fresh ideas, fresh people. Um, I think, I, haven't, I don't know how many bankers have walked out of their jobs in protest of stuff which has been going on, which at least we've seen out of people in Facebook. Yeah. Um, and I just feel that there's fresher thought in there. It's, it's like a younger thing <laughs> and, and I'm being mean and ageist there, but it's just fresher ideas. Um, I don't want them to launch. I don't want them to win. And I think an open permissionless system is way more interesting. I think lots of these things have kind of happened and tried on the web. So there was this thing called the friend of a friend of a friend project. It's called both on the web where they try to build a decentralized social graph. This was in the late 90s, early 2000s. They even use SSL certing and client side certs to build a web of trust to do decentralized reputation. I think all of those things are there. Unfortunately, on the web, due to the, the way the incentive models work or the lack of an incentive model or infrastructure to build an economic um, incentives there, um, it naturally gravitated to centralized entities hoarding and selling off data for advertising. I'm hoping that we have fresh ideas. I'm hoping that smart contracts or um, code, which you know will execute in a certain way and token economics will allow us to build a different future, which is better. Um, and finally, just whilst I have it there, I think there are really interesting ideas, Yalda, around privacy and self-sovereign identity. I think the idea of making attestations, zero knowledge attestations, which don't encode any, um, any personal data on the chain, but it has, for example, someone like the driving license authority making a statement saying that you were born, you are, you know, from this date you are over 18, actually causes less personal data to fly around the world. And there's some really interesting ideas there where the world becomes more private. But I'm going to a previous conversation, sorry. Um, I want Ethereum to win, but if, Facebook, if it didn't, if Facebook came and toppled all the banks, I think that would be a good thing. So yeah, the Misha um, prefers a world where Silicon Valley is installing new infrastructure instead of the, 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 the crusty legacy banks. Uh, but he far prefers a world where it's it's based on a permissionless financial system like Ethereum. And I want to ask you this question because you're sort of our resident expert on on DAOs here. So when I think of a world uh, which is a possible outcome where you have Libra in charge, um, open decentralized crypto systems like Ethereum are just sort of a niche for people, the crazies like us, right? Just stays a niche. Uh, and then you have central bank digital currencies, right? That feels to me uh, very plutocratic because uh, we were talking about plutocracies earlier. Where DAOs can become plutocracies. Um, well, Facebook is by definition a plutocracy, right? It's a, it's a US-based corporation with uh, shareholders and plutocrats who own the shares. Um, yeah, how does that contrast to the Ethereum vision for things? What's your take? Is, is, um, is Libra incrementally better or is it a complete fail for the world? Yeah, I guess I, I never really thought of it in the sense of, well, maybe it's better than the current system, so it's okay. Um, I, I accept that it might be what's next, but I think that we should not like give up 
in the Ethereum space just because, you know, it's kind of like, it's like a leaderboard, you know, it's like there's the banks and there's these other people trying to get to the top and then they go there, but just because they get there doesn't mean you should like give up or fully accept it. And I think that's kind of like, just like with uh, like activism or anything. Like if, you, if you look at like the current, like civil unrest, it's like there are a lot of these like organizations that have been fighting for a lot of like changes for so many years. And then it finally reached a breaking point where it's like all these changes are coming um, or all these changes are happening because people are like fed up with it. And I think that's that's gonna be like, like there's gonna be some, some breaking point with Facebook. Like right now it's kind of like, yeah, you know, people are complaining, blah, blah, blah. But I think at some point it's gonna reach a breaking point where like with the financial system, with with how everything works, hopefully people start to become as angry as they are in the streets today, just about like our our money, our data. And that's, that's, that's what it's gonna take for Facebook to not become in the lead. And I don't think people are really that angry or that like, you know, like fuck the system, we have to change everything. It's like, it's so quiet in the Ethereum space or, or just like, it's not, I don't, so I don't think there's going to be any change anytime soon unless people really get as like, like a digital civil unrest or something. Um, it needs to be like post like Occupy Wall Street. Like it's, it's going to take a lot to actually succeed beyond Libra. Um, if, if Libra even takes hold. I think that's an interesting point that that Yalda makes and echoes from a comment that you made, Lex, about hey, like, what one thing that's in Ethereum is that a ton of the Ethereum transactions right now, uh, most eight billion dollars, are actually on stable coins, you know, centralized uh, money uh, systems. So, like, I want to ask the question of the panel, and maybe we'll start with you, Lex. Uh, is is this what this whole thing requires? Do people have to like actually choose decentralization rather than you know, centralization? Um, do we have to be sort of active rebels uh, of the existing system? Um, do we have to kind of demand that that banks step aside? Uh, or how do you see things? I mean, you're, you're kind of the, the, the bridge in all of this. What's your take? Does there need to be a revolution or uh, will decentralized systems take over naturally? Trying not to give an absurd, overlong answer to to this question, but it's it's hard. It's like yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's my person, it's my personality problem. Um, so a, a couple of things. Uh, I work with a gentleman by the name of Simon Morris at Consensus, who uh, prior to joining used to run the BitTorrent company. Um, some of you might know and not, not know that like BitTorrent had a company and you just think about the protocol, but there was a for-profit company which uh, I guess did some of the original work and then they ended up buying uh, uTorrent, the client, uh, and that was their product, you know, and um, you is might- Is that the one, sorry Lex, is that yeah, the one that Justin Sun acquired? The, the Indeed, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. So it's like trying to get cred for being the original like uh, pirate protocol, you know. Um, anyway, uh, like the BitTorrent protocol doesn't need the BitTorrent company to exist. It's just one of multiple clients. Anyway, uh, one of the things that Simon um, said in, in his analysis of like why he thought media either file sharing, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, or media piracy works or worked was because it was cool because it was, because it was illegal, right? Like if, if it wasn't illegal, if people weren't chasing it, it's possible people would just forget about it and, and not care. It, it wouldn't even stick with um, in the emotions of the audience. And I think um, one of the reasons that, um, there continues to be this engine of development and this engine of innovation and, and everything that we're seeing. I mean, it's, it's, it is rooted in the coolness factor of doing something illicit. It's sneaking out at night and doing something you're told not to do. And I say, I mean, it, coming out for me, that sounds super blasé because I know that for people who are still in, in authoritarian countries, like it's literally a lifeline um, to access Bitcoin and to access Ethereum. Like it's, it's not, um, 
a fun science project to rebuild a you know an asset manager it's like literally how do you not have your money seized um and so i you know i totally respect that and i think that is the wind in the sail but you cannot rely only on the revolutionaries to win the war and so there's a there's a great innovation framework that i'll um, that i'll share that stuck with me and it goes god i'm i'm like on this war kick i don't know why i'm sorry but the 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 framework goes um you start with the commandos who stormed the beach and they are completely uh, allergic to being controlled, and they are fully self-sufficient, and they're generalists, and they're crazy and hungry. Um, and then once you've stormed the beach, you can't ask the commandos to run the beach, right? Like, they move on. They're, they're, they're going to blow something else up. Um, and so then you bring in the military to expand and grow, right? And so, like, I'll acknowledge that me, my personality, like I, I worked in finance, I've I've worked in tech, I've worked in fintech, and I'm working on on DeFi and blockchain. So like, I'm not the commando anymore. I'm the person trying to expand this and make it interconnect to the traditional industry so that we can win more of those assets over. Like, I want all of financial GDP on Ethereum. I don't want it to be only for our niche in in the maximalist way. And then after the 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 military is done, like if we are if we've won, you know, and have a third or a tenth of the economy, then you bring in the police, and that's going to be people who who police the peace and make sure that there's no crime and things don't blow up and nobody's taken advantage of, right? And you have like a stable territory and city. Um, and so if you look at the traditional financial industry, there's nothing left but the police all the time on everything. Um, and so I think you you do need that initial spark of the, of the revolution and the illicit activity. And I'm not making the claim that the activity is primarily illicit. I know it's like less than 20 basis points. Um, but you you need that as a seed, and then you need to broaden out and just accept more types of people into the ecosystem. So, so that analogy, um, you know, of of us, I, I mean, I guess the question is, are are we kind of the the commandos now? We we few who are in DeFi. There's a population of about 150,000 users by some estimates of DeFi tools today, just a just a, a tiny group, uh, maybe a set of, of commandos. Are we essentially beta testing this system for, you know, um, I guess two groups. One, the the later fintech military that that comes in behind us, which is kind of what 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 you might say, Lex. Uh, and the the second maybe is for those in authoritarian uh, countries who don't have access to the banking systems um, th that we do today and whose governments have have failed to give them uh, that access. W what's your take on that, Misha? Like, so m maybe even monolith take. You guys are building a wallet and some some payment rails. Um, are you seeing an uptick in? those countries who uh, don't have access to, um, uh, you know, I'll call it your first world type of, um, you know, banking systems? Yeah, I guess so. We're overbanked in the UK. Um, everything is free there. It's, it's a race to the bottom. Everyone's just trying to get your money. And we, we are seeing more of an uptake because we can only do, we can only, op we only operate in Europe right now. So we are seeing, um, uptick in countries which have, you know, slightly less strong um, financial systems. Um, I think if you look at payment rails, I think the hard thing is, is wanting to be that commando, wanting to turn around and go, everyone should be able to hold their own assets. Everyone, sh no one should be live in fear of having their assets seized. Um, as another type of, we are also a bridging company where we interact with the real world finance and visas and people like that. Actually, we're the first non-custodial position which Visa ever interacted with, which was kind of a learning curve for them. Um, the fact that we can't seize assets. Yeah, I think that really grates on a personal level because I know that there's a lot more, there are a lot more countries in the world or a lot more peoples in the world who would benefit more from kind of seizure, seizing protection than we would in Western Europe, right? Um, I think all of those tensions are real and something which we have to navigate. 
Um, yeah, I think the things which spring to mind in these conversations around m monies and ownership, I think if, if we can get to a place and we can show, to show users or be the commandos who light that fire under people's butts or whatever the, the phrase is, to see that they don't have to give up their vote coming back to the first question they don't have to give up their buying power to give it to some unelected um money making entity which has different incentives or different desired outcomes from individuals and if we can just show that that's a possibility i think that's a win in itself and i think we do feel like commandos there i mean the world will be a better place um, if it's not a bunch of old white men picking where money is spent, basically. And I think it's, it's aspirational and it will do. I think we have to pick our battles. And at the moment, the battle is in trying to get people to understand. And I think now with everything which is going on in the world, um, the racial tensions, the obvious inequalities, COVID. I think lots of things which have appeared in this last year, I think there's a chance for that narrative to actually be interesting to more people. I think it's decentralized isn't enough, but it's why are you giving these people control, I think, or why are you letting these people make all the decisions? And I think that's exciting and something which um, decentralized systems can add to the world and really trying to own that narrative is a hard thing, right? Without coming across like some crazy hippie, you know? Um, and it's something which I hope we can achieve. Let's see if we can do it. Um, I kind well of said. answered your question. I kind of Well answered. said, Misha. Yeah, well, well said. You know, I, 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 I tug on another thread of this conversation here. So, you, you know, Yalda, you were talking earlier about some of the um, civil unrest that's going on. And I think a lot of us are, are seeing that. So Lex was painting a world where um, Ethereum and DeFi and crypto writ large gets adopted the same way the internet was basically, right? So a tribe of commandos at first and the geeks and the, the like weirdos who were using this internet thing. Uh, and then slowly it sort of leaked into uh, regulation. And the US turned out to be in other countries around the world, so most of them turned out to be very um, pro-internet. Uh, in a more authoritarian world, a more sci-fi world, that may not have been the case. An open cryptographic communication prot protocol uh, does seem like a threat to an authoritarian regime, certainly. Uh, they could have tried to, to quash it far earlier. Um, I guess the, the question to you, Yelda, and, and to the rest of the panels is thinking about this, is crypto a check on the rise of potential authoritarianism uh, as well? So there's a happy path that Lex is talking about where like maybe uh, free um, governments around the world, democratic governments around the world, just adopt this technology like the internet. But if they don't, uh, is crypto a, a hedge, a tool for us against authoritarian regimes? I was starting to think of something a little else, some, something different. Maybe it's related um, right before you asked that question as far as like, well, how how, how is this even going to be successful? And I had to do like with the earlier thought, I was like, okay, well, like these stable coins, like, like the, whatever, fiat, USD, that's like the most popular um, ever, or that's, that's like our asset on Ethereum right now. And as long as we keep saying that that is the asset, they've, they have co-opted the system in, in some sense. So it's like how, we can't, and this, this goes back to skin in the game, is is if we're not even using Ethereum or like this these new currencies for transacting, for paying our rent, for paying for food, then how, how can we how can we expect that this is this is going to be more than infrastructure for whatever central bank digital currencies? Um, so I think that um, I forgot your question exactly, but I was thinking like, I mean, I've, I've, and I've thought about this for a while. It's like, I think that 
uh, we actually have to, to think about the physical cities or something and then create like this more digital one um, because you have to start to create some sort of society where you can transact in this currency and it's based, you create a new kind of state stable coin that's based on like the time like it's like you know you're, everyone's working you kind of have a rate based on your work and then you you kind of create your your own stable coin for your economic system that is based on cryptocurrency and then if all the other assets in the world start to become based on your digital coin that's based on this like new economic system then then it'll be successful so i think that um i don't i don't really see like like large strides going in this direction of actually thinking, well, maybe we actually need to start with taking all this like wealth that people have amassed and maybe just like buying land and like building a city. And, you know, maybe it's like a corporate sort of thing where, you know, you buy a bunch of land and it's like a kind of owned by a, a DAO or something. Um, and you're still like within the confines of like the, the regular government, but it's kind of like, you know, you're the Google, um, or you're, you're like these big Silicon Valley campuses, what it's like inside them, inside those campuses, they have those, their own economic rules for how things operate, whether it's like you have like for access to food and this or that. So it's like, I think that that would be something really interesting to see. I mean, I think that's what we need to actually see in cryptocurrency is like, we need to have skin in the game. We have to start, you know, being paid in it and not just like some fiat thing. We need to be paid in some, something that's not based on US dollars and, trust that <laughs> and otherwise we're just like it's just more efficient you know legend database <laughs> so i think i think what one thing that is, is saying is is that basically um uh if all if all we're kind of achieving is sort of this um, stable coins central bank digital currency on top of ethereum well it starts to look a lot like the traditional system anyway and so um crypto native assets, assets like Ether, for, for example, or assets like, like Bitcoin need to be necessary ingredients to decentralize. Um, I, Lex, do, do you have any comments on that? Do, do you share that take? Um, do, do you think we need these non-sovereign um, crypto assets like Ether and Bitcoin in order to create a, a fully or even even a like a, a mostly decentralized financial system uh i do for sure i do for sure think that we need um crypto native assets i i do think we are discovering their their uh attributes and the distinctions between their attributes over time um you know so the initial thesis around bitcoin being both a payment rail and a money and all this stuff kind of blended together i think has boiled down into a store of value that takes two percent of institutional money and that's it um, which is frustrating to a lot of people, but you know, happens to be the case. And then, I think ether or is is largely seen as the oil in the gigantic machine of the computer that is Ethereum uh, that just is there to lubricate its uh, its work. Um, I'm really glad to actually see DeFi uh, over something like ICOs, um, and. I actually thought that ICOs were fantastic as an idea generation period. It's what got me um, uh, excited about Ethereum because you, you saw specialization of concepts and every single industry covered in lots of business models. I think the mistake that ICOs made were to raise money in ETH and then to issue their own token and basically break the network effects of ETH as a money and create a money that was used by absolutely nobody. I think the alternate world would have been that they raise money in Bitcoin, making Bitcoin actual money that purchases something. And then instead of launching their own token, using ETH as their currency for their application. And I think that initial setup just didn't work because it broke apart the use cases and it broke apart any potential economy that would have existed in those projects. And so DeFi is kind of round two and it's round two in a way that makes sense, which is that um, Ethereum is the economic system and infrastructure and you can pay for things with Ethereum assets, native Ethereum assets, maybe stable coins, but you know, essentially DAI is ETH. I uh, just transformed in a math function. Um, so I, I think now we have kind of the correct operating uh, 
format between what the software is and what Ethereum does, and it's correcting that mistake of the past. And all of the ideas that we saw in ICO land will repeat within the next 10, 15 years and become large in the same way that pets.com is the famous joke internet example of somebody burning billions of dollars. But today, the equivalent of pets.com on the web is actually a super functional gigantic company. Um, the um, I think the, the last point that I that I wanted to make on uh, on this topic is we actually, we don't have to invent it from scratch. They're really good analogies. So when you go to Uber, you can't pay with cash. Uh, you have to pay through your app. The payment rail is modern and it's in a different place. When you go to uh, a grocery store that accepts cards, you can't pay with a check. Uh, when you buy something on Amazon, uh, you can't use Apple Pay into your screen. And these are different com commercial systems, right? So like uh, e-commerce, you pay with e-commerce payments processing. Uh, grocery stores, you pay with either cash or proximity payments. Um, you know, and, and there are different systems underlying that. And so similarly, we just, we need uh, crypto native economic activity for which we can pay with our crypto assets. And so I think the way to win is not to figure out how to shove a dollar bill into your into your iPhone um, and yell at Uber for why it doesn't accept crypto, being the equivalent of why can't you buy stuff with Bitcoin. Um, the equivalent is let us grow the things in the garden of Ethereum that we want there, and then we can use our currency to buy it. Yeah, I think I think you're right about that, and it's interesting that Ethereum does have other tools at its disposal to create uh, synthetic uh, assets, like like Dai, for instance, which is uh, largely synthesized um, Ethereum, essentially largely backed by Ether, uh, and some other assets as well. Just just a quick show of hands: um, How many of you guys have used Dai before in the past? Just put your hand up if you have used Dai. Okay. How many of you? So all of you. How many of you have used uh, USDC previously, or another um, stablecoin like that's bank issued, uh, Tether or uh, something like that? You guys haven't. Okay, so you're preferring Dai, and I, I, I wonder if like part of me wonders if that's just because hey, like this panel is composed of the commandos. <laughs> Or whether the uh, the general mainstream is actually going to prefer Dai over USDC, or will they even know the difference? Is my question between the two, without like you know being uh, Myers Briggs personality types that want to actually explore this stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, Misha, I'd love your comments on this because uh, you guys have chosen to integrate die into monolith um, from inception, which is uh, extraordinary because it's a completely bankless um, crypto wallet experience. But like, will people prefer die to USDC or will they even care outside of the commando group that we've assembled here? Yeah, I think, I think it's a shame actually that die is pegged to the dollar because the original thought there was for it to use the SDR, which was more pan-global or less US-centric. And I wonder how much of that is just because it was easier or um, I was putting out a first version. I don't know. And um, SDR, just for our audience, is special uh, drawing rights, right? It's a compilation of multiple, multiple it's, it's fiats, a, basically. It's a basket of, I think, the five biggest fiats, I think. Yen, one pound, dollar, euro. I think. Um, I think I'm not a finance guy. Um, so I wonder about drawing a conclusion that everyone's opting or electing to have um, a government-backed coin. That said, Dai is tiny in comparison to Tether and USDC. If you look at overall volumes, um, I think. The something truly decentralized is interesting. I don't think, I think crypto geeks will probably in, prefer, you know, die if you ask them. And I think 
actually, I think lots of crypto geeks, the, the geekiest of the geeks, probably also realize that there's some untested game theory in there. And we saw kind of flash crashes and all that stuff happening as well. Um, the, I think where, where, where our head is at with this type of stuff is just abstracting this stuff away from users. I don't think a user needs to know. My guess is that there was a UX trade-off around you have one SDR to spend versus you have one dollar to spend. And even though that would have been a more elegant solution, um, a more stable coin as well, it, the UX of a dollar is more meaningful to more people on planet Earth. And I think these, these conversations around kind of not building the optimal decentralized amazing thing over here versus building something which is more people are going to understand i think is going to be a real tension and something which we kind of battle with a lot and um people on the team right now are working on you know this i this whole kind of view of a portfolio view of a list of project tokens with these weird esoteric names on them it's just not what most people on planet Earth want to engage with when it comes to money. I think there's a, a high percentage of the population don't even look at their bank account because they're scared. You know, there's like a huge population in this country of people which talk about how like they don't like they literally don't check what their account is. So this idea that people are just sat there the whole time looking at numbers go up and down is a very small seg segment of society. And where we're probably going to take this is we're going to stop talking about die and, you know, it will just be called dollars or it'll just be called gold or it'll just be called real estate in Detroit. And for the geeks, they can go and click around or double click and zoom in, and see what's going on underneath. Um, yeah, I think this stuff is very interesting and um, it's a bit of a shame that it's all pegged to the US dollar. But I guess that's the world we live in. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the approach is right to um, not necessarily build for the commandos, but build for that next generation of, of DeFi users who aren't necessarily going to be familiar with um, all of the idiosyncrasies of, of like DeFi. Um, don't build for the crypto geeks, right? Um, build for build for the next wave. So I, I, this has been a fascinating conversation. And um, like we've talked about skin in the game, we've talked about um, the idea of uh, decentralization, what that actually means, plutocracies versus democracies, digital nation states. So we've, we've touched on a bunch of topics. And I think all of this culminates, at least, like, at least to me, over the past 10 years or so of the crypto journey. Um, like DeFi isn't just isn't just what we're calling present day protocols on Ethereum, right? It, it seems to me like DeFi has been the theme from day one, from the Satoshi white paper where he talked about peer to peer electronic cash. That was DeFi. It was decentralized money, decentralized finance. That's been the thread throughout this. And so, w w the narrative tends to peg DeFi as it's this set of things, but um, to me anyway, DeFi has been the entire thing. All along, it's always been DeFi. Bitcoin is DeFi. ETH is DeFi. ICOs, permissionless fundraising, that's all DeFi. So all of this culminates in what we're building, at least right now, identity aside, we are building a alternative open financial system for the world. I, I'm going to go to each of you, and I want you to tell me one thing that makes you most optimistic about DeFi right now. We've talked about the flaws. Uh, it's time. It's time to get bullish and get excited. What What makes you? What's the one thing, the single thing, that makes you most optimistic about DeFi? And I will start with whomever puts their hand up first. Whoever's got kind of a thought. Okay, Misha, let's go with you. Yeah, I guess this it's, it's is easy for me because this is my job, right? So, um, I think what makes me feel really bullish is I think the, the laggards and the incumbents need to be scared because there's literally no value being added in commercial banking. I think the, the one thing which they're going to say is they keep your money safe. They allow you to use it when there's no bank run, when they have the cash. And you can get loans from your neighbors, yeah, or you can 
they can give out loans from other people around you who've given them their money for them to make profit. And I think their time is done because you don't need a centralized entity to do all those things. And that makes me really happy. Right? And, um, and all rage against the machine inside. Well said. Makes me want to put on some music. Who's, who's next, Lex? Sure. Um, so for me, I you know I take an analyst's view to our space. Uh, not that I don't want to take a poet's view, uh, and no no better poet than Rage and Zach. How I miss him. Uh, like how good would it be to have modern Rage uh, right right now? Um, Anyway, um, I've alienated at least 80% of the audience with that comment, <laughs> um, or at least 50. OK, um, so, the, the, so the, the analyst view on our space and what, what is really a discovery for me through my career uh, coming out of trying to do fintech entrepreneurship is that um, if you look at the large platform shifts that are now venture capital cliches, so Napster in the music industry is a cliche. Uh, Netflix and Uber and sort of all those examples are sort of cliches. And generally, the framing of those stories is about democratizing access, or like we the the internet digitized access to news and to music and so on. And that's like entirely wrong. It didn't. Uh, it's not about distribution. Distribution is second. Um, because fintech aped what the rest of the internet did and tried to democratize distribution to the same old thing. So Robinhood connects to the same bank account that Barclays does, and all the open banking PSD2 stuff connects to the exact same uh, manufactured financial product you had in the past. $5.3 billion acquisition of Plaid by Visa, you're connecting and interconnecting things from core banking systems from 40 years ago. So um, nothing to date has digitized the manufacturing of financial product. There's just not been an invention that's done that. And that means what FinTech has done is tried to create a Spotify of CDs, right? Or it's tried to create uh, an Uber still based on taxi medallions. The thing itself has not changed. And therefore, you just can't have a fundamental sort of uh, market reorientation that, that we've been talking about. You can't have the 40% collapse in the price and like a wipe out of all the players and a shift because it's still the same thing. And so for me, DeFi is the first uh, time, at least in my career, I've seen um, these like software vending machines manufacturing bank accounts and manufacturing loans and manufacturing trading and manufacturing asset allocations um, in at a, at, a, at a pace that's really like literally 10 times to 100 times faster um, and done by people f with you know one one tenth of the experience of the people in the traditional industry um, which just to me signals that this is a new way to build finance. And then I think distribution is, is distribution is easy. You throw venture dollars into Google ads, right? And then you've got distribution. The manufacturing is hard. And so that's, that's what I'm excited about. All right. Misha is excited about decentralizing the, the banks, getting them out of the way. Lex is very excited about this new financial infrastructure where we can build so much on top and next generation maybe of, of fintech companies. Uh, Yalda, take us home. What are you most excited about with DeFi? Maybe I'm most excited about something that, well, I, I want to be excited about something, but I feel like it's it's what's missing. Um, and I guess it's this kind of uh, cooperation or like strategy. Um, Cause I think that, I think that what what is happening in Ethereum or in like decentralized finance is interesting, but like I, I also see it as uh, like there are all these like small people trying to like you're like we're like fighting this war, but then you're just like not communicating or collaborating because we're operating in like this like free market um, uh, free market mindset. So I think that's that's what I'm like it would it would excite me more if 
people did treat it more as a revolution versus like another capitalist game. Um, not because I think that, um, I, I mean, capitalism, sure, it has its like time and place, but I, I, I mean, I'm trying to like bring a lot of similarities to like what's happening in the world right now. And it's like these like memes, it's like Black Lives Matter, it's like defund the police. It's like you're, you're going with the wave of like hashtags and people that are protesting on the streets. It's like this fully unified cause like globally. But it's like, but then here we are like in the Ethereum space or whatever, we're like, yeah, like do this, do that. But then each company, it's not like, it's not like a coordinated effort. So I think that's, it excites me that everyone is like, or there are so many people in this space and they want like, like fucking change. And I think that that's exciting that, that all these people have come together in technology with some sort of like shared ideology, some sort of shared understanding um, and that's exciting. But if it was just a little bit more, if it was a little bit more coordinated, I think that it would be even like more exciting. Like, <laughs> I want to like wake up and feel like, yeah, I'm part of some something something greater than, I don't know. Right now I feel like it can just use some more, can use some more energy. <laughs> a bit more revolution is what Zelda is saying. <laughs> Guys, this has been a fantastic uh, panel. I want to thank Monolith for putting this on. Um, they are a fantastic uh, smart contract wallet and on rail to Visa. Uh, a bankless, um, bankless Visa account is, is sort of what I refer to them as. So thanks to Monolith for, for putting this on. And thanks for our to our amazing guests. I think you saw three different perspectives here. Um, and and the, like Ethereum and DeFi isn't just one thing, which is which is so fitting because our panel is talking about three different uh, perspectives. You know, Lex talking about it as a as a platform for a new fintech, a new financial system. Uh, Misha talking about it as a, a bankless financial system, and Yolda talking about it as a tool for better social coordination and to bring about change and revolution. It is all of these things, which is the most exciting thing about being in this space. Um, once again, thanks to our panelists and thank you for Monolith for putting this on. This has been uh, Ryan Adams, Ryan Sean Adams, and um, we're gonna close it out now, guys. Thanks a lot. Let's clap, clap, clap for ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> awesome job. Thank you. Take care. I'm just...